I just asked Brian, are you ready? But uh, Brian is always ready. So there's no need to, to even introduce Brian because he's already been on the podcast previously. Um, so one of these people I, I, I met on LinkedIn, I think maybe how many years ago, Brian? When was it that you... God, it's you, four you, years ago. Can you imagine that? How old we're getting? <laughs> Talk about yourself. I still have a lot to give. <laughs> no, but Brian, Brian uh, had a call to action uh, several years ago, let's put it that way. And he was uh, looking for contributors for a huge mm -hmm. project it turned out to be. Uh, his, uh, his book called Psychos. And uh, I'm uh, privileged and honored to be one of the people that uh, did a little contribution to, to the book. Brian took the heavy toe. Um, and we, we've been on the podcast previously talking about his book, Psychos, talking about innovation. And uh, Brian and I have been in touch for the past few years talking about many different things. Uh, so we discussed uh, maybe it would be great to bring you on now because uh, you've been diving into a different field. I mean, you're the innovation guy, uh, but uh, now you're also the innovation guy who's excited about AI and has a lot to share when it comes to how do we utilize it? Uh, how do we you know, create a symbiosis between the human and the AI? So I'm excited to have you back, Brian. How are you this morning? I'm doing fantastic and I'm glad to be back here. It's, um, I mean, the thing that, I started this project writing a book. We had 23 co-authors. What an amazing idea. But I forgot something. People aren't reading books anymore. Damn it. <laughs> and, and you know what I think? I think what's happened is we did a really good job creating lots of good content. And what people want is they want to execute the content quicker, faster, better than they did before. And this really cool thing came up about a year and a half ago, which is called generative AI. And everything that I was doing slow has become faster and faster. And that's really cool. So I'm actually um, in the process of writing a new book, um, which is basically an update of Cycles book. And what we're going to do is Cycles 2.0, which is Cycles with all AI enabled tools. But I'll tell you about that during the talk today. Sounds exciting. And by the way, uh, I'm I'm always happy to talk to Brian. And one of the reasons is he's a, he's a practitioner. Uh, as I remember, started 11 businesses, or maybe even more uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, so he's, he's the kind of guy that being there, done that. And he's also teaching it. And one of the ways to become really good in something is to, to start to teach it because then you have to really step up your game. <laughs> so... Um, Brian, tell me tell me about your fascina fascination with AI in the, the last uh, year and a half. How did that start it and, and what you've been doing, researching on? Okay, so, I mean, it's, you know, I think there's a, an expression, necessity is the mother of all invention. And I had, I was in Africa a while back. Um, I set up a foundation to teach entrepreneurship and innovation set up a big, massive goal, which was to teach a million people in five years. And I had a plan to do that. And that was to create courses that lots of people would give. And that wasn't scaling the way it needed to scale. And what I found out is a way that I could scale the courses more effectively was to teach the courses, but to take AI as my mentor and collaborator in the courses. So what we do, do is found out we can I can teach you how to pitch, Okay, but if you don't practice pitching, it doesn't do any good. So we create, for example, a tool which allows you to pitch and the AI gives you feedback and then people learn to pitch better. So, you know, what I've been looking at is how do you use AI to accelerate things in the classroom? And when you start seeing it accelerating things in the classroom, you start bringing it back to practical things. So there's this, you know, four sort of feet in two camps. One is a desire to teach lots of people. And at the same time, a desire to actually make an impact in the world. And just to give you an idea of numbers, I taught 5,000 people last year. My goal is a million. So I need 199 years to go or better ways to teach. And AI is my better way to teach. So the hype with AI really accelerated with the launch of ChatGPT. You said like, was it 18 months, 17 months ago? 
and mm. ever since it, it seems like it's just it's just going growing and growing and and every every business professional out there is looking into what how should i be well equipped you know how much time should i spend on playing with ai tools because i mean let's be honest there's there's a lot of things that will die out um a lot of these these tools and softwares that everybody's playing with these days mm. uh, they seem kind of cool but they're not so practical yet because it's too early in many areas but but where are we at the moment brian what do you think where are we right now and and what should we do as progressive business professionals that want to be state of the art ready for what's coming you know gartner has these cycles you know where you get really excited and actually you've been really excited and then you get really disappointed and i think with the ai we're in the middle of the great disappointment um to a large extent people are saying oh wow i can write you know, a 127 page book in 16 minutes. But the problem is the book isn't that good and nobody reads the book. And you know, what we're looking at is, you know, AI can produce a lot of content, but if you point it in the wrong direction, it produces a lot of bad content. And, you know, I think the moment that we're at right now is people have started playing around with it. They're a little bit disappointed and they're trying to figure out how do I get more out of this? And my current focus right now is how do you structure the use of AI so that people are more effective? And in a couple words, the easiest thing to do and the most important thing is to structure the problem. Because if you ask the AI the wrong question, you're going to get the wrong answers. And then if you hit the right question, how do you ask the question in a way that AI can actually help and support you? And what I've been working on is a lot of tools that allow you to structure, for example, the ideation process, the alignment process, communication process, and all those things are working really cool. So I'm going to give you lots of numbers today. And I'm going to tell you, you're not the only one who's failed with AI, but you can succeed a lot better. Um, just let me give you a top line number. Um, we're looking at idea creation. Okay, I, Everybody believes in ideas. Ideas are what make the world go round. If I ask you to create a bunch of ideas and I put you in a room by yourself, no AI, you might come up with one good idea per 100 ideas that you produce. I put you in the same room and I give you chat GPT and you might come up with 1.5 ideas. And that's, that's a big improvement. That's cool. That's in the right direction. But if I put you in the same room and I tell you how to use chat GPT and I give you a structure to the prompts and things like that, what you'll come up with is between five and seven. So we're looking increase in productivity in terms of generating good ideas, which is 500 to 700%. It's not just the quantity of ideas, but it's the quality of ideas. And just uh, for the clarification, these numbers are based on your own research or, or, or something else you've studied? So right now, I, I did a big talk a while ago um, which is around the art and science of mechanical creativity. And to do that, we actually did some research. We generated with humans, humans plus AI, no instructions, and humans plus AI with instructions, 5,302 ideas. And we evaluate to solve a specific problem. And then we set up an evaluation criteria for all of those ideas and evaluated them one by one to look not only at the the quantity of ideas produced, but the quality of ideas produced. So yes, it is my research. It'll be published in June this year, by the way. Really cool stuff. No, but I think that's the that's also what people are struggling with most. It feels like a jungle out there. There's just so much tools coming out every day. You, you open your social media, there's the new tool that, uh, and people get, bombarded with like where should i start like you know how do i use those tools in and they produce practical value for me because mm -hmm. they, they all sound good and, and look good like initially with chat gpt people are like okay let me write a book right it's like okay that doesn't work but but <laughs> but then it's like maybe maybe i can use it as a search engine and find some different ideas in there but but how do i structure it how do i use it in a way it has to be personalized for every individual, right? So, so it works for yeah. the specific person to solve specific problems. 
Um, so, so where do we start, Brian? How do we how do we structure things? I mean, I think you know what happens is everybody downloads a prompt and they run the prompt and say, "Wow, this is amazing!" Or you run you new use a new app and you say, "Wow, this is amazing!" But you know, I think people to a certain extent want to get the work done without doing the work, and the reality is that doesn't work very well. In fact, the the good use of AI actually might even require more brain cells than not using AI. Because you know what you need to do is you need to figure out what question you're asking, why is that the right question, and then you need to structure the way you work together. Um, the analogy I use sometimes when I talk is saying, you know, think about AI like a hammer. Okay, you can build a house faster with a hammer. But if you give the hammer to a little kid and say, just go around and build the house, he's going to knock down doors and he's going to do bad things. But if you explain to him how to use the hammer, actually things work pretty well. And it's the same thing with AI. You got to explain how to use the hammer. And I think, you know, what I see happening right now is all these tools that are coming out there and brilliant ideas. And none of them have sort of the traction that they need because they're not generating the results that people want on the other side. And the, the answer to the question is not more tools, but it's more in the mentality of how you work with AI. And the mentality of effective working with AI is using AI as a buddy in the process. If you imagine, if you're doing this by yourself, you've just added, gone from a person of one per, a team of one person to a person, a team of two people. But what you can do with AI is you can create a whole team. Um, you can say, you know, imagine I'm this, imagine I'm that. And you create a series of people working together. But it's not that you're giving the work over to the AI and say, do it for me. And the right way to do it is do it with me. If you want to write your book with AI, great. That's a good starting point. You'll get the outline, get things there. But then you have to do some time editing it. But after you've edited it, this is really the place that GI... AI comes into its own and says, look, I've written this. How do I improve it? And that's an intelligent use of AI. And that's the way the opportunity going forward. I don't know if you'd agree with me yet, Soyan or not. But I mean, you're, I'm sure you're using AI. You've written an email with AI. You look at it and you say, hmm, that's long, but it ain't too good. I mean, look, I, I, when we started writing the second book, uh, initially I was like, okay, let me, let me see how I can utilize AI here, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I will give some different prompts for the, I don't know, the, this chapter is about this and we want to write a book about this. What would you give me? And, and, and to me, it was more, you know, it's, I don't know, I felt like cheating a little bit. If I'm going to use some of those things, it's, it really isn't me. Um, but but there could be some good ideas. Oh, that's actually that's actually a field we have uncovered here. So I would not take what AI written and put it in say that's my book, right? Like as you said, yeah. but but it could be that as you said, like okay, now the chapter is done, it's edited. Let me see if there might be some good recommendations for what is not so good and could be improved. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't done that yet with our second book. We are in a, this final kind of stage now. The editor is. Uh, is polishing the content and editing and so so once it's done maybe maybe that's a good good idea to sort of like okay let's test it against ai and see if there might be some good things in there um but 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 the same thing i mean um but i don't know if you're using if you're using linkedin premium for example like now no. when you start writing a post you know i'm posting a lot and you are as well like we are creating a lot of content mm -hmm. um there's the ai tool that immediately yeah. when you start writing the post with the premium account, it tells you, let AI create the post for you. And I tried mm -hmm. a few times and it's like, I'm not going to use that. It's just, it's so far from me. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you can, you know, you can say the opposite, right? And say, well, why not let it save you time and then you can polish it. And it's still going to be you. But for, for now, at least for me, it, it's not good enough, maybe. But let, let me give you, Three thoughts there. Okay. Um, using AI is not cheating. Um, using AI is smart. It's, I mean, nobody would criticize you for using Google to go search for something on the internet. And AI is basically 
in a lot of ways, just a really, really good search engine, which gives you the results in a nice way that you can use. But you know, the value that comes in the process when you're writing something is give AI a really tough challenge. Say, look, I'm looking about leadership challenges in the semiconductor industry in the 1980s to write a case study in my new book. And AI will get you all that information really cool. Um, but I think, you know, the thing that I've seen really fantastic as far as using AI is as an editing tool. So, for example, you might give it a copy of your book and you say to AI, you say, look, I've written a book. The goal of the book is this. This is what readers should be able to do afterwards. Please now read my book page by page and give me suggestions on how I change the content line by line. And it will edit your whole book and it will give you what you've written originally and it will give you suggested improvements. And then you as a human being can make the decisions on what you keep. And I think that is a smart use of AI. And I think, you know, the last part is, you know, for me, what I feel is whenever I write a post like in LinkedIn with AI, it's just cringeworthy. It's like, oh, my God, I'm not going to put that up. That, that doesn't sound like me at all. But. You know, what I do find is interesting is it sort of stretches your brain a little bit and you say, oh, maybe I should talk a little bit more like that. And what you have to realize is what A has been trained to do is it's been trained to give you the logical next thing. And if it doesn't feel logical for you, maybe there's something wrong with your logic. And there's a reason to consider the suggestion that A is making. That's a very well explained answer <laughs> right I, I i agree with you i agree with you i think you just have to be careful how you use it mm -hmm. and um and re make sure that you stay authentic whatever it is you do i mean we started talking about content for social medias and maybe it's good actually we, we keep the conversation in more specific areas and cases so mm -hmm. the audience can get something really tangible but it's a uh, you know, with uh, with content, uh, we just have to be careful because many people got into this wave of let me write a whole book with AI for, you know, for 20 minutes and then sell it on Amazon. And of course, you can make some money and of course, you can put on that it's made with AI, but it's like <coughs> how good it is, really. Do you want to put your name into that? And if you, if you do a post on LinkedIn, yes, maybe you can use it to, all right, there's a good idea. Maybe I should think about this structure of the text or whatever. But at the end of the day, you got to go through it. You got to put in the work. As you said, maybe there's more mental energy. Probably it's faster. But but you got to, you got to, if you want quality, you still have to be a big part of the process. Mm -hmm. That's what, I, what I'm feeling as well. Tell me about, tell me about, I mean, you, you are a, you're a guy, innovation guy, right? Like, and, yeah. uh, and I, I'm curious to hear if you have some use cases, some ideas on how do we effectively use AI for ideation? Okay, yeah, let me let me get to that, but let me close out the last thing that you were saying, you know, about the you know the process. I think it's Ernest Hemingway, and you you're gonna have to shoot me if I'm wrong. He said the secret of great writing is not writing, but it's editing. And if you think about what you can do with AI, it's working on the editing bit, it's improving, fine-tuning, making it better. And AI can write stuff that's not very good, but can edit great. And I think there, that's the opportunity to make great stuff. Um, now, if we do our segue over AI for innovation, um, I, as you know, I look at innovation as a process. Um, I talk about the process of, a, of the ABCs. You align, you figure out what you want to do. B is you, figure, you build something. C is you communicate and check. And S is you systematically improve it. Now, what can you stay have... a little bit here? Can you stay a little bit here before we dive into AI? But just uh, if you can expand on this idea of you, you have a very structured approach towards innovation. And for many people, innovation is let's go and just get messy and something will cut out of it. Why, why are you approaching innovation in a structured manner? But well, you know, the, the thing is, you know, the heroes of the innovation process for years and years have been people who can build ideas. Oh, I want to be the creative guy. But, you know, the reality is most ideas are not very good ones. Um, and that's part of the ideation process. But if you want to look at, you know, the source, 
you know, the root cause of failure of innovation. It's most often, most often that you built the wrong thing. It's you haven't built something that somebody wants, which is actually before the ideation phase. It's alignment, figuring out what people want. Um, if you have the next phase, which is building ideas, most people don't fail there. In fact, lots of people fail. But the second biggest cause of failure is communicating ideas, trying to explain what you want to the audience. So if you look at the two biggest failures around innovation, it's before the building the ideas and it's after building ideas. And we're all focused in the middle bit. And what I'm trying to do is trying to get people to look at it as a process. And that process is if you forget one part, the whole thing fails. You know, it's, it's like you walk, you know, think about Starbucks. You walk into Starbucks in the, mo in the morning. Um, everything has to be perfect. The music has to be there. The coffee has to be good. The table has to be clean. All these things. If the table's dirty when you get there, your whole experience falls apart. It's the same thing with innovation. It's not that you can get one part right, but you have to get all the parts right. You have to build, ask the right questions. You have to answer the questions in the right way. You have to be able to check if your answers are any good and you have to improve them. So, you know, the reason I come back to the systems view is actually systems are what make things work. And, you know, for me, the starting point there was looking at how managers complain about their employees. You know, I said, ah, my employees can't innovate. Oh, they're idiots. Oh, well, you know, come in and do a training for me. Teach them how to innovate. And, you know, there's a lot of research showing that, in fact, innovation doesn't fail because of the employees. In fact, they estimate somewhere around 6 to 10% of failures is due to the employees. That means that 90% is left due to the systems. So if you don't create the place for innovation, if you don't create the procedures for innovation, things don't work. And we're spending so much time on the little bits and we're forgetting the big thing. Does that answer your question, Elstoy? And I, I figure I'd go off on a chance every time I, I answer this. No, no, I, I love it, Brian. I love it, actually. This is this is such a such a good uh, point you're bringing. I actually have a couple of follow-up questions before we get into AI. I think the what's... It really, you really hit a nail with the one of the challenges, the biggest challenges is that people are probably not solving the right problem to begin with or, mm -hmm. or they, they're innovating on the wrong thing and spend so much time and resources and energy. So, so I'm, I'm wondering, and I know you wrote a whole book and you have many courses, but like, <laughs> like if you can elaborate a little bit on what can we do to avoid that how do we ensure that we innovate solving the right problem well you i can give your your listeners a simple test okay you're going to work today could you explain what you're doing at work today to your mom in a way that she understands as clearly and simply if she can't then you've got a challenge, which is alignment. And the alignment challenge is figuring out what you're doing. What's the story about what you're doing? What are your objectives? What don't you want? And what are your restrictions? And making that really, really crystal clear. So for me, the biggest opportunity is clarity about where you're going and why. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but it's, you know, if you're going to change something, that's what you have to change first. And make sure that you're asked, you know, you know, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? You know, what does your audience want? And, you know, we get so thrilled by all these things we build. But the reality is a lot of times the people who have to buy things, you know, have to pay for our stuff are not that thrilled with what we're building. And, I mean, just to give you, you know, a fact-based number, they estimate that 40% of products fail because they built a product that nobody wants. And okay. some of them so actually, some of them work great, right? Some of them are yeah, they're, they're fantastic, but nobody <laughs> wants the damn thing. And you know, they asked me. How do we avoid that? How do we avoid that? Like, uh, by the way, there's there's many founders listening to this to this podcast, many entrepreneurs. There's also some people in innovation and in, in, in product. What do we do to to avoid this type of scenarios? I mean. 
Yeah, I'd like to tell you to read my book, but that's that's I'm going to tell you to read somebody else's book. There's a there's a book out there called Competing Against Luck. It's by a guy named Clayton Christensen. And he says, you know, how you know innovation is is a crapshoot. I mean, you just say go out, you throw your dice, you see what comes up. And he says, no, it doesn't need to be that way. In fact, if you can define what you want to innovate, your odds of success go up dramatically. And what he shows that, in fact, instead of a 10% success rate, you get up to 60, 70% success rate if you just clearly define what you're doing for who. And he talks a lot about something called jobs to be done. So if there was a founder out there, I would say, look, you, there's a one thing that you have to do. Figure out what the problem you're solving. Okay. Make sure it's a real problem. Make sure that they would talk about it as a problem. It's not because you know you see it as a problem in your life. Make sure that somebody really has the problem and make sure that you're really solving that problem. And that's the simple problem. Promise. Get the two fitting together and make sure that it's, it's really there. If you're not doing that, then you got an issue. We recently had a guest on the podcast. He's the founder of a company called Lean Plum, got acquired by another company, Clever Top. Um, very successful founder and we were talking about the early days and he shared this story where him and his co-founder decided to accelerate this process of figuring out whether the problem is real so they booked themselves to a conference that was full with people that they they were thinking are the target audience so it was 250 people the whole conference mm -hmm. they got a list of all the people they split the list in two and they were like, we got to talk to everybody in these two days and see if they, <laughs> if they want our product. And yeah. he, he, was, he was like, hey, you, are you Maria? How do you know my name? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about this. So he basically, they, they, they succeeded. For two days, they talked to 250 people. Mm -hmm. and, they, and then they had a really good data whether people want or not this product. What should they do? What is the real issue? Is this feature that we're planning to build actually, does it make any sense? Who is the real target group? Because they mm -hmm. were assuming that these are the people that want this product and need this product. And then I think by the end of it, they figure out we need to tweak it. We need to pivot a little bit. We need to, this is not the person we sell in the company and so on and so forth. And, and then for two days, they have it figured out. See, now this is a brave founder. I mean, typically what I see as a founder is they spend six months building stuff. Okay. And they're building amazing stuff. And at the end of the six months, they start talking to people. And when they start talking to people, they don't ask the question, do you want this? What they ask you is, Stoyan, this is really cool, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree? And they're not, they're not getting your feedback. They're actually just looking for validation. So I love the idea of a founder going out and actually just asking people, you know, do you want this thing? Because that's a question most people don't ask. Um, there's another guy, if you could ever get him on your podcast, his name is Alberto Savoia. He talks about something called prototyping. And I think it's absolutely brilliant. And he talks about make sure you have the right it before you build it. And... <laughs> And he talks about, you know, what could you do to test your product in the next 24 hours? No, don't build it better. Don't make it better. Just what can you do to test whether people want it? Do you have the right it? And that is the starting point of everything. And, you know, just if I can do a segue for just a second, you'd say, hmm, how could I use AI in this process? Actually, AI is great for these nervous founders. What you can do is you can say, look, I've created a product that does this. Please now create a list of 30 potential customers. Okay? Define them. Tell me who they are. Give me their personas. And now I, I want each of them to evaluate my product. And they have to tell me reasons why it isn't a good product and what do I need to improve. So you don't even have to be out there getting slapped and you know getting beaten up with you know people not liking your ideas but ai will actually start kicking your tail already and giving you that type of feedback and that's what a founder needs to do they need to be ready to ask tough questions do you want this thing and you need to get feedback and if you're a bit nervous ai is a great way to do it because you know if they don't like your product no no big worry instead of 250 people 
That's that's really good, man. I'm I'm actually thinking about using that after the podcast just to just to get the, a bit of a tough love from AI. See if uh, if I have things right <laughs> and what what could be improved. And uh, I mean, as you said, uh, you got to be smart in using AI, right? And this 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 sounds like something that will really give you results really fast. Doesn't mean you shouldn't talk to people. Okay, right? Human and AI symbiosis. Like also yeah. maybe maybe when you get some good suggestions from AI, you can you can test it with real mm -hmm. people and say, mm -hmm. okay, AI thinks that the head of engineering in companies are people who need my product. Okay, mm -hmm. let me call 50 head of engineering people actually see to validate that that makes sense. Right? Symbiosis, as you said, is uh yeah, I mean, it, and I think the thing is what happens, we get a bit enamored with what AI is telling us and we start believing what it's telling us. Um, you know, it's not always true. You know, on the bottom of the page, you know, ChatGPT even says ChatGPT makes mistakes. And of course it makes mistakes. You have to be intelligent in what you're doing. But, you know, the thing is, use it in a smart way. I mean, i give you a, a great example. I teach a course on pitching. Okay. I have people make a pitch. And they have to define who their audience is. Okay. That seems pretty easy. I said, okay, now take your pitch and I and I want you to create an audience. And they're going to evaluate your pitch. Oh man. <laughs> and the thing is, the AI does a better job of evaluating than most human beings do. And the reason is they don't get tired and they can keep on going. And they actually are concerned about you a little bit. Um, rather than you're you know, your friends who say, yeah, that's great story. And, you know, come on, <laughs> let's get back to our beer and talk about what's coming up next. And, you know, and I think, you know, the smart use of AI is using AI to define, you know, what you're doing, um, but also to check on the other side is what you're doing clear, interesting, useful. You know, do people understand it? And there's a lot to be said for that. So just to understand, you personally, do you record yourself and then upload the audio and then get feedback from AI? Or, or is it more on the text uh, that you are receiving feedback? So, you, know, the, you know the expression, the cobbler has the worst shoes? You know, sometimes we talk about what you should do and then we don't do it ourselves. Of course, I would love to record all my speeches and all the things and review it with AI, but I just don't have enough time to do it. But I can tell you it's a really, really smart thing to do. And if I had the time, I would do it. Um, but typically, the way that I do it is I take a text and I upload it because it's a lot easier to work with text than it is to work with audio. And, you know, when you do that, you can get quick feedback and go forward really fast. And, you know, a lot of events that I have to do, um, I procrastinate like a lot of people do. So, you know, I've got an, I have an event tomorrow. And, you know, I need to produce it. So what I might do is I might do the slides and then use AI to give me quick feedback on it. And it just sort of accelerates the whole process. And, yeah, so questions. Do I do it all the time? No. Should I do it all the time? Yes. Probably. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's like, you know, should we exercise every day? Of course we should. But we don't always do it. No, I agree. I agree. Um, and I think, as you said, if you have a presentation tomorrow, you can either create the slides and then get some feedback and recommendations, but you can also ask AI to create the slides first and then see if there's any slides that you like and you can keep the structure, the frame, huh? then you create the slides and then, then you can still get feedback. I guess this yeah. is, I haven't actually done any slides with AI. Uh, I know that many people do, at least the initial first draft I have a presentation about this and that and that. Create, uh, you know, whatever presentation with 20 slides with many visuals. Da, 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 da. And then they're usually quite happy with the initial draft and they get a lot of ideas from there. I haven't really used it. Uh, I don't know if, you, if you've done so that it, before. I mean, there's two ways to do this. One is you can go to the 30 different um, deck maker presentations and they say, give me five lines about your what you're talking about. And then it makes a pitch for you. It makes a presentation for you. Um, those are pretty. The graphics are nice, but they're pretty empty. Um, a better way to do it is actually to write up a story about what you want to talk about. And take that story. And then you say to AI, look, I'd like to make a pitch deck that 
lets me communicate this story. Um, if I could give you, you know, uh, you know, the prompt here, or you put it up in the links, links to the notes, there's a simple prompt and say, look, imagine you're a pitch expert and you get this story. How would you put it into a presentation? And what I'd like you to do is give me a title for each slide. I'd like to give you two to three bullet points and you give me the script that goes with it. You put that up in ChatGPT and it'll give you an outline for a presentation in about five minutes. And it'll be pretty good and it's content driven. And the thing that comes up is, you know, there's content and there's form. Um, you know, these pitch maker things are really good at getting the form there, but they're not very good at getting the content there. And the intelligent way to work together is you as a human being, make sure that you have the right content. You use the AI to give you form. You put the two together and then you work again to make the content and form work together. So the idea is a process working together you're the instigator. You're deciding strategically what you want to talk about. Don't leave that up to AI. I, I wonder if you've if you've been doing also. I know many people are using examples. So like you feed AI with an example and say, here is a LinkedIn post that uh, like you know take this framework of the post or the structure and create something similar to this. Or or here's a presentation, uh, something you know just see how it's structured and on the topic of this and this and this create similar model or structure like i don't know have you used that and this type yeah, of I've used it but i mean i mean here you know what you're doing is actually what works really well to human beings as well if you say look you know you have an assistant you say look i'd like you to make a new ai a new post for me here's three that i like build something like that and lo and behold they're going to be a lot better than if you just say go build me a post and AI is exactly the type of same type of thing. You give it a constraint, you give it a, a search space to look in, and it'll get better and better. And you know what I'd like to do is just take a detour for a second and talk to you a little bit about what AI does really well. AI is about search, and it's about analogy. Okay, so search, find me things that do this, find me posts that are talking about this, and it does a really good job. Analogy is give me something that looks like this applied to my thing. And if you can structure your question, so it's either search or analogy or preferably both, AI will come back with something really cool. So if you want to do your LinkedIn post, so I want to do a LinkedIn post about X. Here's five posts that I like. I'd like it to look something like one of these. And what I want it to do is you know, appeal to architects in Venezuela. And what it'll do is it'll make a post that appeals to architects in Venezuela and it'll be really good because you've structured it and put it in a context. Or, or make make it sound like uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> wow, no, that's a bad <laughs> thing. I'm sorry, we're gonna get into politics. Right? It sounds like Donald no, 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 it's just it's just fun when you ask it to it starts saying we have a tremendous thing here. It's a, the most tremendous. It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be amazing. You can't get better than this. We're gonna... <laughs> no, but, but you you can make it sound like somebody, right? That's also kind of a. But ideally, that's you, right? Like make it sound like me. Here's ten posts of me. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I find that doesn't work very well to, to a certain extent. Maybe my maybe I hear mm -hmm. myself differently than, than I write, but I find it's hard to to get AI to write things in the way that I write. Um, maybe that's because I'm not writing well, but maybe it's just AI doesn't write like me. But I, I think, you know, to come back to something useful is, and I'm going to give you a, a fact. Did you know? that there's the gold standard for innovation, which is the ability to patent something. To patent something, something needs to be meaningful, unique, and it has to have some commercial value to it. Did you know that 97% of patents are for things that exist already? I didn't think now, and if, if you think that 97% of patents are for things that exist already, um, you're in a world where and it's actually something that exists already in another context. If in fact, the key to searching for ideas for 97% of the time is finding something that looks like this already and applying it to someplace new, 
AI can do that a lot better than I can or you can. You just have to set up the question in the right way. Set up the question so it's a question of search and it's a question of analogy. Do you understand what I mean? Can you can you give an example? I do, but I would like an example of maybe... I know you have actually a lot of examples in the book, in the cycle <laughs> book, uh, with uh, you know pat patent that been for something that um, already exists, but maybe not in that context. Um, give me a challenge. What what's something you'd like to do this week, historian? Something I like to do this week? Yeah, give me give um, me a check. Give me I something wanna, you want to do. Like like a ideation perspective or innovation, like a business perspective, right? Okay. Um, so let, let let me let me think. Let me think. Um, but you, you have to help me because I'm 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 not sure exactly. Like, give me a more concrete prompt. I <laughs> got <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a AI that's being given a really unclear prompt. <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's. I mean, this is what we do. Give me ideas to do this. Um, exactly. That's what we do. That's a great example. Give me ideas. What you do this week is like uh, do sports, something with my business. I, I, what exactly do you want me to give you? So, right? so you do a lot of work with engineers, right? Yeah. Um, so you... no, I want to say a lot, but I do work with uh, different teams. Yes. Okay. So um, let me see if I can give you an example. You know, the idea is you have to define your specific problem. Mm -hmm. You say, what do you want to do? Um, make it really simple. I want to drive faster. I want a car that goes faster and is safer. Okay? okay. Most good innovation is a contradiction in things. When you drive faster, you should be less safe. Okay? That's just the way, the way things go. But it's not always true. Um, race car drivers don't tend to get in accidents because they die. And they've learned to go fast and safe at the same time. But if you could say, look, I want to design a car that drives faster and is safer. And there's a secret place you might find a solution to this. It's something called TRIZ. TRIZ is a Russian methodology that very few Westerners know about. It's called TRIZ and the Theory of Inventive Principles. And they found 40 principles have developed have been used to develop 90% of all patents that exist. So if you were to give us the following prompt, I want to build a car which drives faster and is safer. And I'd like you to develop two ideas for each of the 40 TRIZ inventive principles and give me those ideas. And lo and behold, the AI is gonna pop out 80 ideas for cars that are faster and safer. You can take any challenge you want as long as you have an objective and a contradiction and then throw in, you know, give me solutions to this. I want to build a car which is fa faster and safer. And I want, you know, the ways that 20 famous inventors would solve this. And AI will pop out lots of ideas. But the trick here comes back to, again, defining the challenge and then trying to find where AI is going to search for it. And you'll you'll find it works really well. We have a uh, we have a listener here live, Andre, who's saying hello, and he's saying, uh, "Ask AI for an idea." I think it was when you asked me to give you a <laughs> challenge. He was like, "Maybe write ChatGPT and say, I have a guest, Brian, who asked me on the podcast, what should I give him?'" <laughs> Becomes like a like a circle, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Thanks for so, being with us, Andre, by the way. Thanks for listening and, and hope you enjoyed no, this no. conversation. But, but I think, you know, the, the thing that comes up here is um, ask AI to, for an idea is a pretty sure recipe for a failure. Ask your mom for an idea to solve your business challenges. It's not going to work. But your mom is usually pretty clever. If you can structure the idea, she probably is pretty good at giving you an answer. It's the same thing with AI. If you structure the question... AI can give you a response back. And, and by the way, just coming back to, to the example you gave with the similarity of um, allocating AI to do, let's say, a LinkedIn post, you can go and say, hey, uh, here's a couple of examples, do something similar. As you said, you can do that to your assistant. 
but also there's the beauty sometimes is in not biasing AI because you want new ideas. So it depends on what you what you're looking for, right? If you want something concrete, you know this kind of. Let's get back to the LinkedIn post. This LinkedIn post, I love this structure. I just need some somebody to save me time. So I push yeah. it to my assistant or to AI to create some sort of a post and then I can, mm-hmm. but, but in certain ways, and this is by the way, useful for working with humans, right? Because sometimes mm-hmm. in our head, you know, we just eh, drop it, right? It's okay. What do I want to get out of it? Do I want to get some new directions and ideas? Because if I tell my assistant, here's, you know, this is the topic, write a post. Hmm. He or she might come up with some ideas I never told of, right? But if I yeah. want something very specific and concrete, I know what exactly I'm looking for. Then it makes more sense that I teach them, I give them some examples that they can follow. So, so it's how much cre- like space for creativity they want to allow. So if you're looking for things that work 97% of the time, I think you're really good to define what you want, give a story, define what you want, and you know, give some clear guide rails. If what you're looking for is the 3%, the things that never existed any, anywhere before, go tell your assistant, go create something that never existed before. And now what you're going to do is you're going to get back a lot of stuff that's bad, but you might just possibly get that one amazing thing. And I think what we're looking at for most of what we're looking at in innovation is we're looking for stuff that's substantially better, substantially good, something that works. And there you're in the world of looking, you know, search for ideas within this box. Um, it, let me give you an example of creativity in action. And I'm not, I can't do this live with you because it doesn't work. But if I, if I was to do it with executives and I asked a specific question without context, Please tell me all the things in your refrigerator right now. Okay. And I ask one group and they list the list. And I ask another group of people, please tell me all the things in your refrigerator, which are white. Who do you think gives me a longer list? It's a good question. I, I don't know. It's always the second one. Always. When you give context, when you give restrictions, when you true? give... Is that true, Brian? Is that, is that, is that it, true? I mean, it is I thought you're going to say the second one. I thought you're going to say the second one. It made sense, but... Try, try it in an event. You'll, you'll be amazed. I said, how is this possible? How can you... Po-? I mean, there has to be time constraints and things like that. Right, but right. You said it's... Creativity. People, people with, give you a lot more answers. Creativity with restrictions, constraints. That's what make people you know, creative. It's... You know, the, you know, if you, if you look, you know, conflict, a little bit of, you know, friction, you know, if you look, the Renaissance was created, you know, at a time where there's incredible conflict and, you know, they, in a hundred years, they changed the world. You know, what happened at the same time in Switzerland where everything was wonderful, they created the cuckoo clock. I mean, you, you, you have to have a little bit of, of, you know, constraints you know, to cre- develop the creativity you want, to get the innovation you want. And the challenge that comes up, you know, for you as a leader, for you as a manager, for you as an entrepreneur, is to create that creative tension, which allows you to find the good solutions. And think within a box. And, you know, just, you know, back to AI for just a second. AI is never going to create the next big idea like a mobile phone. They're not going to create the idea for a computer. The things that didn't exist in the past where there's no, no analogy or nothing that they can search for, AI is never going to come up for it. But 97% of what's there, AI is able to do. And you just have to think, what is your challenge? And if my goal is to have a business which works and is profitable, I'd say, yeah, I'm going to shoot on the side where I get 97% of the time things right. I, I love the the focus on you know like the the creative limitations actually make your process more effective. Um, I, I think that's something as as you know entrepreneurs, founders, managers, uh, we sometimes forget to how important it is to 
to create um, structure, to create clear intention, and and to provide creative limitations and restrictions, as opposed to when we delegate um, certain tasks to say to give all the. Free I just want people to be free. Yes, but maybe the if you want them to be fully free and you, there's no direction at all, that might actually limit them. Um, there's a we had a author of a book uh, visiting the podcast. Uh, her name is Natalie Nixon, and she she's using this metaphor. Oh, I know Natalie. Oh, you know Natalie. Uh, yeah. She she had this book, the Creativity Leap, and she the, the whole book is based around this uh, the concept of. Uh, you have to toggle between in between uh, wonder and rigor in order for creativity to to arise because if you're fully wondrous and mm -hmm. crazy and messy but there's no rigor there's no structure there's no intention um or if you're fully rigorous and there's just like everything is kind of set in stone and th then then you're kind of killing creativity as well that's her yeah, kind of no, it's the yin and the yang. You you need you need you, you need things to balance out a bit, and you know creativity with no rigor uh, doesn't sh generate things, and rigor with no creativity doesn't generate anything. The word rigor, if you think about creative industries and creative people, it doesn't. I mean, most creative people will say rigor. No, I I want to be able to to, to create, to be free, to, to yeah. experiment, right? So, uh, talk about that a little bit. So, you know, if you were to go back in time and talk about the people who are most creative, you talk about the people like um, Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin. These are all people who had rigor in their lives. They approach creativity with a systematic focus. They said, I'm going to try something and see if it works and I'm going to improve it over time. That is what built big ideas. The big ideas... Yeah, they don't just sort of pop up. They, they're grown, they're nurtured over time, and they get there step by step. And, you know, the thing that I, one of my buzzwords, you know, yeah, I grew up in America. I believed in the power of everything, and I believed in you know, empowering people and so on and so forth. Um, a few years back, I did some research looking at what drives innovation. And one of the things that we found is that companies that provide a lot of autonomy tend to deliver less innovation. And I said, oh, shoot, how is this possible? Everything my mom told me when I was little is wrong. Giving people power to go and things like that, it doesn't work. And then I said, look, I just can't believe it. I can't trust this. And I said, let's look a little bit more into the details and say, look, it is true. Companies that give a lot of autonomy tend to deliver less innovation results. But in companies that are clear about where they're going, that know exactly what they'd want to do, and they give autonomy, they get great results. And the reality is in most companies, they don't know what they want to do, they don't know where they want to go, and they give people autonomy and things blow up. And so there's this balance between rigor, which is defining where you want to go, saying this is what we want to do, this is why we want to do it, and then letting people be creative. But letting people just say, oh, go be creative, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm. And we started this talk about systems. And what you need to do is you need to create the system, the structure which things work in. And that system is clear definition of what you want to do. That's the starting point. Once you've defined it, you got something really good. We also have metrics to decide if what you're building is good. Building ideas, that's the easy part. Anybody can build ideas. You can bring in an artist to your company. They can give you a thousand ideas tomorrow. Then you, your next step is actually communicating things. That takes a lot of, lot of energy. And you need some domain expertise. Checking if those ideas are any good. You also need domain expertise. And then you know the last bit is, is the systematically improve, which is the persistence. You know Your first idea isn't going to be great. You, you're planting seeds. You got to water, water the seeds. They got to grow over time. You got to take away the weeds, and you need to kill a few of the trees so that there's space for the other trees to grow. And this is about being systematic. It's rigor, because you're defining where you want to go. You have clear metrics in place. You're killing things off. Um, by the way, 
Um, there's a great study out there showing what separates great innovators from average innovators. And the most important significant difference is great innovators kill more ideas than bad innovators. And when you kill ideas, you make space for the great ideas to come in. I would definitely love to, to get uh, links to a few of the studies that you just mentioned. It's fascinating, Brian. And uh, since we're getting close to the to the end of the episode, I just want to give you space to to share anything that you want to share connected to the topic of today. Again, I'm giving you some creative limitation, right? Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> to make it easy, me my box. Okay. I don't want to say anything you want to share. I want to say anything you want to share connected to the topic of for the listener who is probably an ambitious professional listening here right now, trying to get some practical ideas. What would be your recommendation in terms of, you know, learning and utilizing AI so they can start getting uh, practical value from, from the usage? Okay, so let me close out with a couple of recommendations. You want to use AI to make your life easier. You want to use AI to do things better. You want to do things, use AI to make things faster. You can do that and it can dramatically change what you're doing. But the way to use it is to start out with clarity of what you want to do. Figure out what you want to do and why. What are, what are your objectives? What's the story behind what you're doing? What are your restrictions? That is the starting point. It's defining your challenge. And then doing a process of working together with AI you know, setting up the boundaries, you know, using ways to create ideas effectively and then working together with it step by step. Your great idea is not going to be the thing that AI, the ChatGPT spits out in the next two minutes. It's not going to be there. You're not going to find it. But what you need to do is you need to look at the output that's there. Go through it. Really think about it. Your job is not to pr produce a hundred pages of stuff. Your job is to produce two lines, two sentences with miracles and brilliance. It's not all the things that you're doing, but it's cutting away the, the chaff and being left with the gems that are there. So my, my suggestion for you, AI is a fantastic tool. Use it right and use it to work together and build better, bigger, faster ideas than you ever did before. And if you want, come see me someplace. I talk at lots of events about this stuff and I can give you lots of facts and figures about what works and what doesn't work. And a lot of what does work is a little bit counterintuitive. The idea, for example, restrictions help. There we go. So I don't know if that helps your listeners at all, but I think there's really... Let us know, guys. Let us know. If you're, if you're listening now, let us know. Uh, you know, you can always send me a message on LinkedIn, send me an email. And Brian, maybe maybe that's a good time for you to share where could people get in touch. And on top of joining your, your talks, what could people do if they're connected to what you do? Um, like, how can you help organizations? I mean, and you're, you're consulting, you're teaching, you're doing many things. Can you briefly describe how could you help organizations and individuals? Okay, so if you want to reach me, the easy way to reach me is look for Brian Cassidy. And people typically misspell my name in two Y's. It's B-R-Y-A-N and C-A-S-S-A-D-Y. And you look for me on LinkedIn. There's two profiles, one of them, which is an old one that doesn't exist anymore. The one with a few thousand connections, that's me. So connect with me on LinkedIn. Love to hear from you. What I do with companies is I help put in rigor. I put in tools, I put in methods, I put in principles which allow your teams to do things 10 times faster, five times easier, and take out 70% of the risk. If you want to talk with me, fantastic. Love to work with you. Love to work with companies. I love to work with people that have impossible challenges. And I'd be happy to talk with you and any of the people you're working with. And just contact me. Send me a direct message. I'm open to a chat. My mission right now is to coach, train a million innovators by 2027. Um, you know, I'm I'm open there. I'm in a teaching mode more than I am in a charge you for my knowledge mode. So reach out to me. I'd love to chat. 
And by the way, Brian, once again, uh, is the author of the book Cycles. What was the subtitle so people can get it? Sub Cycles? The simplest proven way to innovate faster while reducing risks. I had to look at the title. There of the you book. go. There you can you find go. the book. <laughs> it's you can find it at the cyclesbook.com. It's really That's easy. easy. That's easy. Yeah. The cyclesbook.com, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being with us to the end of the episode. Once again, if you have any thoughts, any comments, make sure to 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 reach out to me or get in touch with Brian and uh if you enjoyed this episode, you might find the other 177 episodes interesting as well. So go check it out, Productivity Mastery on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and any other major podcast platform. So yes, once again, thanks for being with us. Go innovate. Can I, yes. Can I yes, end with ahead. a promo for Stoyan? Actually, if you were here because I sent you to this link, go to Stoyan's podcast. He's got some great stuff great pe speakers great people to, to get stuff you really should do it and i i think you'll enjoy it cheers thank you so much brian so everybody have a great day and let's keep performing <laughs>